This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to the Democratic House Leader, Eileen Fillercorn, representing a portion of Fairfax and just glad that you're here between sessions to talk about the last session. And in case there is a viewer out there somewhere who does not know already, it's historic that you are the Democratic leader. The first time that any caucus has in Virginia has elected a woman to lead the caucus in only 400 years, <laughs> but, but finally. And delighted that you're in that role and especially thank you for being on this week in Richmond. So jump right in and talk about some of the successes of the past session and 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 let us know about then what what lies ahead well sure thank you so much david i'm thrilled to be here i appreciate the invitation and yes it's uh it, it is historic um and it was uh you know exciting i became the uh the leader on january 1st and uh it's a true honor um we have an amazing caucus just an amazing uh group of legislators that um that make up our uh Democratic Caucus, and they're so uh, capable, confident, um, really interesting backgrounds and um, varied experiences, and uh, and on top of that, they're the most diverse caucus we've ever had. So there's so much to be proud of. So it's a true honor for me to to be the leader of the House Democrats. Uh, Democratic and, caucus. and one of 49, 49 right. and 51 Republicans. So it's as close as it could be without exactly, being a tie. Exactly. Exactly. Really yes. Is. And uh, wait, you mentioned this this past session and. Um, it, obviously, it was a challenging session um, in some regards, but it was also extremely successful. We have so many accomplishments um, to point to. So legislatively, we had a lot of successes. And again, it goes back to our amazing members um, with their experiences and backgrounds. They have so much to offer, and they're so, such great leaders and champions on so many issues and causes that are near and dear to our hearts. And uh, this session uh, was no different. Uh, my focus really was to keep everybody um, on, on task, recognizing that we are, we are here in Richmond to do a job, and that's to legislate. And so we had ample opportunities to stand up for the issues and values that are important to us, to introduce uh, some fabulous bills, uh, whether we're giving speeches on, in subcommittee or um, in full committee, championing our bills and defending our bills on the floor, giving speeches. Um, we had a lot of opportunity to do that and a lot of uh, successes. So, so what? You mentioned the successes. Name a couple of them. Sure, what? sure. So one of the one of the most important issues to us as a caucus has always been and will always be education, and uh, we're so proud of the uh, the opportunity that we had through the governor's budget to uh, support a five percent raise for teachers. Again, education so important. And when I'm out there, and, you know, in the in our districts and knocking on doors or at events, that's what we hear about. Uh, most often, and the opportunity for really for all Virginians to have a, um, a world-class education, regardless of your zip code, is important. Um, teachers, uh, you know, educating our future. There's nothing more important than our teachers. And while no 5% raise isn't uh, sufficient and isn't enough to compensate them, um, it's a step in the right direction, something we're very proud of. We've also been working on um, housing trust fund for so long as well and the ending homelessness and um, again, the opportunity that we had to increase the amount of money in the budget, another, another success and something we're proud of. 
as you know, I do a lot of work with uh, working with people with uh, special abilities, shall we say, instead yes, of disabilities, right. and always been a champion in working, working on behalf of, um, uh, with a lot of stakeholders and great organizations. And again, our caucus is, has been working on, on, um, you know, on these issues year after year. This year, we were able to um, uh, end the cap, the autism cap. Uh, for insurance, which is incredible. So many individuals and uh, with disabilities, and specifically that have autism, are were unable to get uh, coverage. And uh, so for so many parents, this is really life-saving. Life and again, just one of several issues that we have worked hard on year after year, and that we saw successes on this year. Another one, obviously, transportation. Oh, yes. I yes, mean, transportation, yep, yep. not just in Northern Virginia, but of course, coming from Northern Virginia, that's an issue near and dear to our hearts, and when I'm out, um, which is often, um, you know, talking to, to folks where we hear about the traffic, we hear about the condition of the roads. And uh, this year, yet again, um, more, more success. So we were able to get um, over $280 million um, included for, uh, for, for the roads, for transportation as a dedicated funding source. And um, this is going to make, I mean, you know, um, a, a huge, huge difference for so many, not just in the I-81 corridor, although, again, 50% of that money will go towards the I-81 corridor, where the bulk of the, the, our uh, commerce, the roads, um, the trucks travel through. So it's so important, not to mention for the rural areas. But in addition to that, there was uh, additional money for other roads, for other interstates, and, um, and not to mention also for NVTA, for those of us in Northern Virginia, the $20 million to um, compensate for some of the money that we lost uh, with regard to the Metro funding. And it's interesting to note that, that uh, those successes, when you look at the votes for that actually came from the Democratic caucus. So again, yet another reason that, um, that I am so proud to represent, um, uh, be the leader for the House Democratic caucus. How did you find working across party lines? I mean, even if we go back to the teacher pay increase, that certainly was one that seemed to be quite bipartisan in right. support. But there were other issues that, that were, was challenging at times. And so cast into this role for the first time as the leader of the 49 working with the 51. Any thoughts or comments right. about that? Sure, David, you're right. It's, it's, always, it's always an issue, uh, but it's always something that I, I pride myself on, the ability to really work across party lines to get things through. And um, I think that's so important when you come down here. And we can, we can point to lots of different issues where we've had success. We've had the ability uh, to, to work across party lines, to compromise, and you know, to move things forward for Virginians. And you've heard about several of them here already. Um, but unfortunately, there are some issues that we have not had those successes with. And, you know, and it does come down to elections have consequences. Candidates matter and elections matter. So whether you're talking about the anti-discrimination legislation that's so important to us and our members in the caucus, we have introduced legislation bill after bill every year because the truth of the matter is our caucus is all about equality, equity for all, and treating everybody with respect without discrimination. Uh, regardless of the color of their skin, where they come from, the language they speak, or who they love. And so this was yet another year where we introduced a lot of legislation, and unfortunately, we were not able to come up with enough, enough votes. You mentioned earlier, we're at 49. Another issue, um, again, women's issues, women's health, and also the Equal Rights Amendment, and you saw that as well. Um, unfortunately, despite the fact that 80% um, of Virginians say they, they support gender equality, the bill died. Um, unfortunately. And, um, and another issue that's so near and dear to my heart, and again to all of us in the House Democratic Caucus, is gun safety. And uh, we did have the opportunity to move forward with additional funding for, uh, for counselor-student ratio, which is so important again in our schools, but unfortunately not when it came to gun safety. And we introduced bill after bill every single year, common sense gun safety legislation, which really, David, would actually save lives. And unfortunately, there was no, no room for compromise. And unfortunately, those bills died this year. You know, some maybe look at the statistics and say, well, she's only been in the legislature for 10 years, and now she's the leader. But I think if they dig in some, they realize that you worked in the Kane and the Warner administration, that you're a government relations specialist and attorney, and, and and probably also it could have been a reflection of the fact that the caucus itself is not made up that much of, of older people. It's people younger than you, people <laughs> your age and, and other ages. So um, as, as the caucus made the decision, it wasn't uh, 
what has been done sometimes in the past in both caucuses, saying, okay, who's the oldest among the group who's been right. here, or who's been, got the most seniority? So again, quite a compliment to, to the caucus and to you that you were selected. Well, thank you. I, again, it's a tremendous honor um, to, to be the leader of such a, an august body and uh, with so many amazing members of our caucus. So. We've got two or three more minutes. Sure. So now let's, let's shift the focus, if you would, uh, toward 2020 about issues that already that are on your list and on, on the caucus list of, of being crucial issues for the upcoming year. Sure, yeah, we're, we're working already on, um, obviously we came back from Richmond after the reconvened session, getting ready for the elections in 2019, but it's not too soon, you know, too early for us to start really focusing right. on legislation. So again, as you, you heard us, me mention several different issues that are so important to us, not just those that, uh, that didn't pass, but obviously all those will be introduced again, but just for us to have the opportunity to stand up for working families. Um, we're concerned about the environment and what, what can we do. Um, you know, moving forward, um, gun safety, education, transportation, um, all of those issues, you know, uh, are so important to us at the core of our democratic values. And um, so we're working currently on uh, putting together stakeholder groups and coalitions as we move forward and uh, start the process of drafting legislation for next year. And as the governor's working on his budget, I'm sure that the caucus will be involved in working with the administration on Absolutely. that on that budget because it really will be the governor's first budget to introduce. That's right. Absolutely. And um, you know, again, our our concern and you know our issue, concern on issues actually are aligned. And um, the governor and uh, his fabulous cabinet are working hard. And uh, you know, we're we're proud to work with them as we move forward to uh, to pass some good bills, good legislation moving the Commonwealth forward. Well, very much appreciate your being on, and we have another minute. So there was probably something that you thought David's going to be asking me about this, but he <laughs> hasn't. So uh, any any closing thoughts that you would have? I appreciate the opportunity to be on today, and um, you know it was like I said, we were very proud of the the session that we had legislatively. We were able to move the ball forward while standing up for so many issues that are near and dear to our hearts. And uh, where we would, did not have legislative success, we're very much focused on uh, what a what the General Assembly can be like um, as we move forward and increase our numbers. And uh, there's a lot of energy and excitement out there. And uh, so we're looking forward to uh, moving forward towards November. I'll tell our viewers that they don't have to be in Fairfax to contact you. If they want to contact the Democratic House leader, they'll find your information online. And, Absolutely. And they should be in touch with you because the decisions will be made in the summer and the fall that will affect what will happen in 2020. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again very thank much. Thank you so much, for, David. I look forward to having you back again. Thank you. Look thank forward you. to it. Thanks. Delighted to have as a guest Rachel Bittekofer, who's the Assistant Director for the Wasson Center for Public Policy, also a lecturer in political science all at Christopher Newport University. And we really appreciate your being on because we want to talk some about this most recent survey that you did of well over a thousand registered voters in Virginia. And let's jump right into it and particularly start, if you would, start talking about the reactions that you saw to the three statewide officials. Yeah, I'm excited about this survey. This is our first survey in the field since the scandals that happened um, over the winter. And um, it was also a survey that was designed to catch the atmospheric conditions uh, that will govern the state legislative races. Right. Uh, so uh, those two things combined made it a particularly compelling survey, I think, for people who are interested in Virginia politics. Uh, and it also allowed us to get a measure not only of how uh, um, much of an impact those scandals had, particularly on the governor, Ralph Northam, but also how much of the Virginia electorate was plugged into that the way that we were here in Richmond and, and the political um, you know, uh, elites, I guess I would call them. And it turns out that there's a, a fairly sizable chunk of the Virginia electorate who is you know, not really following that kind of stuff. So. Right. We're going to be showing some of the graphics from your survey, and I think the first one we'll be showing is a gra graphic that shows the, the reaction to the governor, the attorney general, and the, the lieutenant governor. Um, 
As you reflect on that particular one, was there any significant difference in, in, in the reaction that people had to the three? Yes, so I mean, I would first point um, out that when we look at the collapse of approval ratings for Ralph Northam, uh, we see a steep decline between December and our March measure. So he was at 59% in that December right. measure, and he's at 40% today. He is actually five points lower than President Trump is in this survey, so that tells you a little something. It's also, um, I would say, a product of Democrats' willingness to disapprove of their own governor. Uh, when you ask self-identified uh, Democrats, they'll say, I disapprove, whereas 91 percent of Republicans approve of Donald Trump. So that helps buffer, buffer that overall number up for Trump. Um, but um, when you're looking at that graph, too, you'll notice that the two other uh, lower office holders, the lieutenant governor and the attorney general, have overall lower approval rating to, to declines and, and lower approval ratings, and that's because you know, in a normal situation, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of registered voters who are already a more elite sampling of Virginia's adult population don't know who the lieutenant governor and the attorney general are, and therefore were not capable of expressing an opinion on their job approval. So uh, just one thing to look at when you're looking at that graph is why they're lower than Ralph, you know, Northam is. You know, when I was going through your, your survey results, and again, we'll make sure that we're showing this graphic too. There was one that showed that about 23 percent, I believe the number is correct, didn't know that there'd been anything that had transpired in, with regards to the governor. Yeah, that's right. And I wanted to capture that because as I was watching the scandal unfold, the um, national media, because of course, jumped into the state and did a couple of, you know, what we would call flash polls on the issue. And one of the things that I noticed with their flash polling is they were making a giant assumption when they were interviewing voters, and that was that all of the voters they contacted understood and yes, were paying attention. Right. And um, I knew that was a mistake because one of my interest areas is the decline of civic literacy and civic participation, as, especially as it relates to polarization. So when I knew when I went into the field with this project that I was going to want to measure salience in the electorate, and, and I knew, too, that if I had been walking, you know, through the campus of my university and, you know, stopped random students during the height of that week and said, hey, can you believe what's going on in Richmond? I might not have gotten the response, oh, you know, I feel so scandalized. I might have gotten a response of, huh? You know, yes. So, yes. Um, you know, so that one of that nice things about the way we did the survey is, number one, you don't want to be telling respondents about political phenomena because your survey at that point is informing people and not measuring yes. opinion. And number two, it does, it lets us know we do have a crisis of civic uh, knowledge and literacy, and you can see that in newspaper subscription and media consumption rates. So, I think, if, I'm, if I recall it correctly, your results kind of baffled me, and I, and I would have missed it. I would have guessed it would have been a younger age group that was not informed, but I believe, if I'm right, your survey showed that it was it was more the median of the older group that that made up a significant part of that 23 percent. Yes, so it is just it is distributed across uh, all age groups. And uh, that said, though, when we look at who the nice the crisis of information and, and media is, it is going to be Gen, Gen Z and millennials. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see when we can see that in, in newspaper subscription and even, you know, cable and TV subscription data. Uh, that they are just um, much more inclined to choose media that they can control, and you know, it's it's unfortunate because it's it's killing local papers and local media. So, yeah, you also did a survey on if, if elections were held today, and you were trying to, I guess, again trying to see what impact perhaps the scandals, as you referred to them in plural, uh, had to do on the electorate. But I think the, the, while the margin was fairly close, it was still leaning more Democratic. That's correct. So some of the national punditry has been wondering, will this help Republicans who have had two, um, you know, really actually cataclysmic electoral cycles here in the Commonwealth? Um, but my own research, which is focused, again, on polarization and voting, voting behavior, uh, has anticipated, actually, the 2017 and 2018 blue waves, and, in fact, 
I have a forecasting model that anticipated exactly almost to the seat, the uh, 2018 seat uh, gain in the House of Representatives for Democrats. So I um, was very uh, doubtful that that was going to be a major factor in vote intention. Um, and it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, what governs voting behavior now is national conditions. And so for Democrats, what matters is that Trump is in office and that that is what's, you know, getting Republicans have had a really tough time at the ballot box because Republicans are not as enthusiastic to vote and Democrats are extremely enthusiastic to vote because Donald Trump is in office. So, um, you know, that's definitely uh, not surprising to see Democrats have a slight advantage on that generic ballot question, would you vote for a Democrat or a Republican candidate for the House or State Assembly? Um, and this also translates to that control question, would you like to see the Democratic Party or the Republican Party in control of the General Assembly after the elections? And uh, I'd also add to the particular scandal that's plaguing the governor is um, something that's not contemporaneous, it's something from his distant past, so I think that's one thing. But two, voters are not seeing that in a vacuum, they're seeing that in relation to the multiple scandals coming from the president, right? So when you're looking at Ralph Northam in, con in conjunction with what's going on with President Trump, it might seem, uh, you know, a less pertinent issue that he had this yearbook photo with back in the 1980s, and I think voters are seeing it in that regard, too. You know, while it was not a part of your survey, but knowing your field of expertise, with the gerrymandered districts that we have, it's is it difficult at all to try to, to, to see what's the impact in House District this or Senate District that? Because there, most most of those districts are really drawn to favor one party or the other. Well, a, main, a major feature of my forecasting uh, model, which will be also deployed for the 2020 election and will debut on the Watson Center website on July 1st, shameless plug. Oh, July 1st of this year? <laughs> July okay, 1st of this the, year. Okay, we got the website to it, put up. To yeah, get, and it's also been featured um, in the New York Times already. Yes. Um, so a major feature of that actually is partisan competition through, you know, so basically that's gerrymandering. So if a district is so gerrymandered that there's no mathematical possibility of it to flip, that is, you know, certainly gonna have an impact. But many districts are like the seventh, Virginia's seventh district, where it was robustly Republican, but it wasn't out of the bounds if the electorate, like the, like the composition of the electorate went through a profound change that a Democrat could take that district. And that's why I was able on July 1st of 2018 uh, to say, you know, that district is going to flip. Abigail Spamberger will be the next member from that district. Oh, you said it that and early. They, and it was a yeah. good thing it happened because the Washington Post printed it in print that day. Yeah. So, you know, I really yeah. needed that to happen. Right. But it was um, based entirely on the fact that Henrico County had this huge untapped reservoir of potential what I call latent Democratic voters that had not been motivated to vote in the 2016, 2014, 2013, and 2010 cycles, but whom for whom the Trump presidency had been, you know, the political effect like kerosene. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about the survey, another aspect of this, this survey that you just did, I was somewhat uh, surprised on the abortion issue, mm. that there was such a small percentage that were either, as I would say, to either extreme position on it. Um, t tell our viewers some about that, that question that you surveyed. Yes, I'm very pleased that I included that question. Um, you know, one of the problems with measuring abortion opinion is the companies that have been in business with uh, surveying for a long time are kind of trapped into a poor wording for that question, and they, they stick with their wording because they want the ability to hold on to the ability to, to compare their data over time. So uh, the Watson Center doesn't have that problem. We're a relatively new, you know, we only have about 10, you know, 12 years under our belt in operation. So I was able to design a question that really captures the contemporaneous debate about abortion. Should it be, you know, completely uh, illegal with no exceptions for the mother 
mother's health or rape or incest, or should it be um, you know, completely unregulated, and is any attempt to add restrictions in late-term abortion you know, tantamount to attacking the right to abortion you know, overall? So the question asks respondents to pick on this spectrum that offers both extreme and you know, middle of the road, a variation of middle of the road preferences. And as you point out, it reveals right. that our parties are much more extreme yeah. than our average Commonwealth voter is. And I, I did that because I know abortion is going to be a major feature of the campaigns this fall. Right. Send people to your website to check that one out and get more information. Our time's up, but we're going to have you back again. And we thank you very much for being on this Well, thank you so much. It's thank such you. a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.